Thank you so much for coming to the 30th anniversary of the Tampa Bay Inventors Council. And let me introduce you to the president, Wayne Rasnan. Thank you all for being here. Um, we're really excited to have you. Um, sometimes we wake and we go through our day distracted by the things that, that fill our lives. We fail to appreciate the wonders that we all too often take for granted. A hundred years ago, flying was nearly impossible. A hundred and fifty years ago, during the Civil War, there was no AC power, no electric light bulbs, no telephone, and the QWERTY keyboard was just a crazy idea in somebody's head. All of our stories were told face to face. All of our music was performed live. Except for a few magical music boxes that someone invented. Because it is inventors that push the envelope. It is inventors that drag the progress of man forward. It is inventors that make a difference in improving the quality of life for everyone. We sometimes forget that we arrived here today on the backs of giants. We were carried into the future by those who invented before us. We have very little compre comprehension of how far below us the ground is. The wonders that we enjoy today were once just someone's idea, someone's vision, but then it was crafted and made whole and turned into something real. Free, creative individuals persevered against the odds and invented the things we enjoy today. Today we celebrate inventors and mark the passage of 30 years since the foundation of the Tampa Bay Inventors Council. I want to thank you all for being here and sharing with us a celebration for all inventors. The Tampa Bay Inventors Council, as with most inventor organizations, works on a simple premise. Inventors helping inventors. We help by offering some guidance, by offering suggestions, connections and opportunities. We help steer you away from wasting your money and we share with you our experience with people with whom we have associated. We don't take your idea and turn it into a product for you. We don't write your patent. We don't buy your ideas. We only, only you can determine your future. Only you can decide if you will persevere. Only you can make you a success. Today we are joined by some very successful people who have agreed to share their stories with you. The founder of the Tampa Bay Inventors Council, Ron Smith. Thank you, Ron, for coming. <laughs> My Cool Inventions radio co-hosts, Ekos Jankura, close enough, and John Cremens join us. Thank you, gentlemen. But first, I'd like to welcome the father of the direct response industry, a man who has turned more ideas into gold, the founder of AsSeenOnTV.com, and a Shark Tank investor, Kevin Harrington. Can you hear me better here? Okay. Well, I'd like to say I've been here now 20 years in St. Petersburg, Florida, so I'm a resident. I love the area, and I've been involved uh, with the Inventors Council for close to those 20 years. And um, I wouldn't be in the business that I'm in if it weren't for many of, of you here because I don't invent products. And that's the amazing thing is what I like to do is partner with inventors. And that's, you know, that's why I've been involved. In fact, um, it's funny because when I went to shoot the Shark Tank show, uh, Mark Burnett called me and I went out to Los Angeles and I was sitting in his office and he, I, no one knew what Shark Tank was. It was just for the first time explaining that people are going to come up and present their product or their idea or their invention in front of five sharks and we were going to either say yes or no or invest and I said, Mark, I said, I've been doing that for 25 years already, you know, so um, in fact we did right at the at the at uh, the uh, Inventor Council headquarters over there uh, when you were on, on Brian Derry. You guys are still over there? Same place? Well, we're okay. different, different, but close, still on Okay, Brian so I remember probably 10 years ago, and this is many years before Shark Tank, uh, we went over there and it was myself and a couple other panelists and we, we sat in front of the room and 
inventors would came, I think we did about 30 or 40, and it, and it was a full day, and they got 10 minutes to give the pitch, and then we were giving green lights or red lights on whether or not we wanted to move forward with these products. And this was long before Shark Tank. So um, I just want to say congratulations to, how many are inventors here? How many we got? Just about the whole room, right? So um, I want everyone to give themselves a hand, because it's, without, without you guys here, I wouldn't be in business. And, and I've actually only invented one item, and I didn't make money on that one, so I don't even like to talk about that one. Um, so I'm gonna share a couple of secrets, a couple of ups, a couple of downs with you today. Um, and one of the things I say, when you come up with an idea, you've gotta take it to the next step. You've gotta to try to create a brand, try to create, um, in some ways, become uh, influential, becoming a key person of influence, I say, or to become a brand of influence, and that's creating some brand success. Now, you take a but I wanted, I wanted, before we show you Arnold, Arnold is the guy that I met. God bless him, he passed away just about a month ago now. Arnold is the guy I met in Philadelphia. He was demonstrating, just like he's about ready to do right there, he had a knife, and he would cut through a Coca-Cola can, then he would cut through a hammerhead, and then so finely, a sliced of tomato that he said you could read the Sunday newspaper through it. This was one of my first infomercials, and you'll see it's very low budget, very low quality, but you don't have to have a half a million dollar or a million dollar budget. We shot this show for $3,500, and this is just a little clip. This is back almost 30 years ago. Now, you take a tomato, the weight of the knife alone cuts that tomato. Let me ask you something. How many knives do you have at home this sharp? You could drop the tomato on top. Pretty sharp, right? You know what one young lady said? <laughs> Can you cut them thin? I said, thin, one tomato will last you all week long. <laughs> there you go. That was Arnold. He was, he was a funny guy. And this product, Arnold was selling the Ginsu knife. We shot that back in the early 80s. This went on to do over $100 million in sales. And Arnold, he was the best knife guy in the business, and he'd been doing this for 30 years, okay? Uh, when I met him, I said, Arnold, I watched him cutting and doing all this, and there was 20 people standing there, 10 of them pulled out money and bought that Ginsu knife set. And that's when the light bulb went off in my head. Let's just turn a camera on like we did there and put him in front of millions of people instead of just 20 at a time. So, um, you know, I think from there, Arnold got smart. And he said, Kevin, you know, we had big success. We're selling millions of dollars in, in knives. And he said, but I know a lot of other people. And are you interested in other products? And I said, absolutely. So we went back to the Philadelphia Home Show where I met Arnold the year after. And he introduced me to Billy Mays and to Sandy Mason, to Wally Nash, and all these people. And they all had their own products. And this is when I said to myself, I don't need to be an inventor. I just need to find the people that do the inventing, the people that have the products, and that's why I really love participating in events like this. So, you know, I'm gonna share with you some of my ups and downs that I had over the years. I call it three steps and a stumble, uh, because I can't sit here and just talk about the successes. I have to also talk about some of the failures. And the first thing I say, and many of you are probably like this, is put your mind in curiosity overload. And for me, it was, it was kind of simple because I was a young entrepreneur back 30 years ago. And one day, I actually mailed a letter. And you, you'll notice this is the directory of mail order catalogs. I mailed a letter, and I got every catalog in the United States. There's 2,000 catalogs. I mailed a letter saying, I'm an avid catalog buyer. Please send me your catalog. Now, my wife calls them junk mail right now, okay, uh, which it, you know, kind of is, but, um, you know, I looked at it as opportunity, because what I do, and what I did at that time, is I got 1,500 catalogs came back in my mailbox over the next three, four months. So I, I categorized them by industry. I put all the houseware catalogs, and the pet catalogs, and the hardware catalogs, and the beauty catalogs, fishing, golf, et cetera, into stacks. And now, when somebody like one of you walks in and you have, let's say it's a fishing product, I now have 
35, 45 catalogs I get to go through and see what's going on in that industry. What products are moving? What's selling? What color combinations? What is the trend in that industry? That's how I stay on top of that industry, the fishing industry. Now, when my son, who's now 25 years old, he graduated from Penn State, he started working three years ago for me. I put him in a room and I gave him a big stack, first week, a big stack of catalogs. And I gave him the houseware. And I said, go through these catalogs. He said, there's 75 of these. What, what, do you, what am I supposed to do? I said, just go through, and we'll sit down in about two hours. So two hours later, I came back in, and I said, so what's going on? And he said, wow. He said, I don't know what I'm looking for. He said, but there was two or three products that I kept seeing in catalog after catalog after catalog. And you know, what's, what do you think that? I said, what do you think that means? And he said, must be a winning product, must be, I'm, he's starting to see trends in those industries. So this, here is a 25 year old, three years of, out of college and five years, almost five going through college, okay, had a little, little stumble himself, but um, that is now in two hours working in the industry, already understanding the trends in that one industry. And so, you know, he went through that whole product development phase with me and then I said, curiosity overload, Brian, let's start going to trade shows. And we go to 20 plus trade shows a year. We do the houseware show, the hardware show, the fishing show, which is called the SHOT Show. That's in January in Las Vegas. Just came back from the electronic retailing convention. It's all these guys over here. I do the CES show. Uh, we do the PGA golf show, the toy fair, the beauty show, etc. And what do we do? We look for trends. We look for new products. We put our minds, again, in curiosity overload. And so what this afforded me was one day I said, you know what? I'm going to go to the golf show. I don't, never sold any golf products. So I'm sitting at the golf show, and this guy shows me a golf club. And this is the club that he showed me. What is top touring pro Davis Love the Third's secret to the perfect swing? There's no secret. It's simply knowing the proper swing technique. And now you can learn to swing like a pro with the Medicus Hinge Club. The secret of the Medicus is this scientifically engineered hinge that will break whenever a flaw occurs in your swing. $200 million in sales, the Medicus Golf Club. The number one golf training product in the history of golf. And... So I'm sitting at the golf show, and this guy's showing me this hinged club, and I'm like, wow, what an invention. Somebody in this audience here can come up with something like that. That's for sure, because this was cool, and it forced you to groove your swing. If, when, I, when I first got the club, I went to swing, and it flopped, and I couldn't complete my swing. And when, when the guy that invented it said, no, you have to smoothly go back and groove your swing, and then I could complete the swing, and boom, I hit right through with the club. So that was an amazing invention. That was just because I had a curiosity overload to go to the golf show and found that product. And that became a huge success. 23 years this has been running on television. Al Guyberger, Davis Love, you name it. It's one of the, the, the number one golf training products ever. So then I said to myself, well, gee, we've done kitchen and now we're doing golf. How about fishing? And this was when I went to the went to the first fishing show ever, it's called the SHOT Show. It was in New Orleans back then. And here's what I found. This, this inventor comes to me and he says, Kevin, do you fish? And I said, you know, I have, I'm not a great fisherman, but he says, think about it. What, what do all lures do? When they hit the water, they drop straight down, gravity. And he said, that's the lure business. In fact, he had a, he had a fish tank set up at the show, went from that wall to that wall, it was about eight feet high with a bunch of fish in it. And he says, let me show you a regular fishing lure. Goes out, drops down, right in front of the fish. No fish were touching the lure. And he says, I've, I've invented the most unbelievable fishing lure. And it's called the flying lure. And when it hits the water, I've reverse rigged it so that when it hits, it swims away like a wounded fish. And that's this show right here. Flying lure looks, acts, even feels just like live bait. Fishing itself with pre-programmed action. It moves through the water just like a glider flies through the air while it gently falls right into the fish's face. The flying lure goes where no other lure has gone before. I've caught copy, I've caught walleye, stripers. That was, we had amazing testimonials from kids to women to 
um, professionals, Bass Pro uh, champions, etc. And this was again completing my my thought here of curiosity overload, fishing, golf. We got into beauty. We got into fitness every single category, so I welcome the opportunity to hear about many of the items that all of you have here today. So um, the, the second step in this three steps and a stumble, and Flying Lure, by the way, sold over 500 million fishing lures around the world. It's the number one fishing lure in the world, and television is what brought that lure to life, without a doubt. The testimonials that we got from that product were amazing. So. Uh, step two is something many of you probably do as you think about products and you think about solving problems. I use the word hijack because if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. And that's sort of a cliche, but, you know, hijacking your habits is a different way to think of it. And, you know, because just like I talked about the fishing business, you know, all lures would just go straight down. Well, he had to, he hijacked the way he was thinking as an inventor, and now the lure was swimming away like a wounded fish. So that's what I try to do in my business, and I was sitting back in 1990 with a library of infomercials that had only run in the United States, and I, and I said, I've got, to, I've got these assets that could be worth more because what happens when they do movies? In the United States, a movie comes out, where does it go? International distribution. Germany, Holland, um, they, they put them in 20 plus languages all across Latin America, Spanish, Eastern Europe, Europe, uh, Latin America, etc. So that's when the light bulb went off in my head and I said, I need to hijack the way I'm thinking, much like inventors think outside the box. And I said, let's take this show. I took Tony Little over to the Cannes Film Festival where all of the international movie companies go to get distribution around the world. And this is what we did with Tony Little. Dubbed his show in 20 languages. And these are all the phone numbers and phone centers that we set up all around the world to take the phone calls we were running in all across Europe in, in about uh, 16 different languages at that particular time. Then we took Kim Kardashian, same thing. Very short and sweet, but that was Kim Kardashian's first infomercial called the Pressabella Steam Iron. And this is before she really got famous, but um, it, we dubbed it in all the foreign languages and, um, and it became a, a big success all over the world, not just the United States. So this again was just thinking a little bit outside the box. So I, I say at this point right here that if you're doing business today the same way you were two years ago, the end is near because you have to be really thinking towards what is the most advanced way that I can connect with the people. In fact, this leads me to step three, and this one, I hope you guys have some notepads and you can take a couple of notes because we're gonna, step three has got a couple of key points. And this is how to build a brand for your company or for yourself. And this, these, these steps are pretty powerful. As I say, the perfect pitch is step one. And on Shark Tank, the, the last year I was on, I did three seasons on Shark Tank, 175 segments. There was over 50,000 people that came to get on the show that last year. And out of that, we only took 300 that got approved to come and give their pitch. And guess what? This particular lady did not give the perfect pitch when she started crying, okay? So, um, you know, unfortunately, if you didn't give the perfect pitch, your show didn't air. And your segment didn't get on because they, they over... Uh, shot so that you know we'd shoot enough that they could always take the ones that didn't look good. So, so the perfect pitch is important. It's, it's, it has to be very concise, and I, I give you just a three-step process of creating that pitch. It's tease, please, and seize. And you tease, and you, if you see TV commercials, you'll see a little teaser up front, 
And then you've got to please the people. What are the benefits? What's in it for me? And then you seize, you, you ask for the money, you ask for the order. And that's the perfect pitch. And here's a guy that came to us, and he, and he was a, a personal trainer. His name is Lazo Freeman. I said, Lazo, what's your perfect pitch? And he said, I get a kick from motivating individuals to be the best they can be. I said, that's not a perfect pitch. That's not very good, Lazo. I said, let's work with you on this. This guy was an amazing personal trainer, and actually over in the UK. And so we worked with him and changed his perfect pitch to this. I only do exclusive, radical, 12-week body transformations with business leaders, celebrities, and public figures who achieve amazing things at work, but ordinary things naked. Okay? <laughs> All right? So that perfect pitch. This guy has a nine-week waiting list now for people that want to get to see him, and he's got six personal trainers working for him because they don't get to come to him until they've been through one of the people that work for him. So this perfect pitch was his amazing way to transform his business, and just like everybody here, there's, when you go to trade shows, What's your product? You need to have that concise, solid, perfect pitch. And it works amazingly if you, if you can transform that. Now, skill number two is publish. You can publish a book, yes, all right? Um, you can publish a newsletter. You can publish information. You can put out a blog. You can, you can do um, publishing even uh, any kind of um, little uh, print publication on tips on how to be an inventor and things like that and um, you know I, I published my own book because in the ideas economy being published shows an ownership of your niche so when I did my book I went out and did a lot of radio talk shows and radio is very powerful and you're gonna meet two guys that have a great radio talk show uh, for inventors and these shows can be very powerful to give you credibility so um, you know, not everybody will publish a book, but this lady here, Hattie Hassan, came to us, and we have a, a group, we work with people to help publish their books and get uh, uh, publicity, and this was one of the things, she came, she was a struggling female plumber over in the UK, and she said, you know, I, in the UK, women actually, they are afraid when plumbers come because, you know, they got the, their cell phone there, they're ready to you know, speed dial their husband if anything strange starts happening, you know, and letting a plumber in. So she had a real niche, but she wasn't getting business. So we published her. And when we did, this took her business to the moon. She created the book, The Joy of Plumbing. And this was a big, big success, became a huge hit on Amazon and, and the author. And she also created her own association then, the Association of Female Plumbers. And she went on from here to do, you know, BBC and radio talk shows, and she has a she's a huge now celebrity, based off the, the game plan that we we put her on by putting this together. She also put out 16 DVDs for female plumbers, how to be a female plumber, how to get business, and now a lot of them do work for her. So um, this this publishing is a way to get new customers and also retain your existing customers. And, you know, at the end of the day, it, you know, there's, you know, I, I tell the story now because I'm, I'm moving to, to this third step. I, I have a lot of friends that are doctors and lawyers and chiropractors and accountants. And what happens with these guys is they work all day long. And just like you know, I talked about Tony Little, I'm going to tell another story about Tony here. You know, they didn't productize themselves enough because Products never sleep, and there's probably nobody better than this crowd right here to understand this, because doctors and lawyers and accountants, when they go to bed, they're done. They've got, they can't be billing while they're sleeping, or they're not supposed to be, okay? So um, productizing is this third powerful step. And so when I met Tony Little back in 1989, Tony was a bodybuilder and a personal trainer. And I said to Tony, I said, how do you, wh what's your, your business model? And Tony said, well, 
I charge $40 an hour. I go to people's homes. I start at five o'clock in the morning. I do six or seven a day until I can't do it anymore. And then I'm done. And so, and he, and he's building his business. But so as I got into Tony's head on what he, what his real strength was, his unique positioning, Tony had a business model. It was called target training to the people that he trained because he trained bodybuilders. So he could get a, a big bulge right there on an arm. He could get rid of those love handles, tighten up the glutes, whatever part of the body you wanted to target to train, he could do it. So we brought Tony in the studio and we said, Tony, you're, you're making you know $1,000 a week. It's a decent income and you're a personal trainer, but let's create, we've shot six one hour DVDs. We called them target training. This was Tony's first infomercial, 1990, the Target Training DVD set did over $300 million in sales. And Tony Little was now America's personal trainer, and this was his catapult. This was his first ever infomercial, and it was a huge, huge success because Tony Little realized, I need to productize myself. Just like this guy right here, Jack LaLanne, he's a, when I met him, 1990, he was a healthy, old fitness guru. And I said, Jack, how do we unpack your valuable IP, your intellectual property? And Jack, I, I said, Jack, tell me how do you stay so fit, so healthy, so unbelievably, God bless, he passed away a couple years ago now. He was over 95 years old, Jack the Lane. So Jack said, Kevin, he says, every morning I drink carrot juice, fresh carrot juice. And he says, it's unbelievable. I got this little juicer, and that's when the light bulb went off. Juicer. So we did the Jack LaLanne juicer, and this was when Jack became a healthy and wealthy old fitness guru. Okay, so, um, so th this is version two. I did the original Jack LaLanne juicer. It was called the Juice Tiger. In 1990, we sold hundreds of millions of dollars worth of juicers. And um, this is just taking productization. And so many of you that are here, if you know, when, when you tune in to some of these celebrities and some of these people like Forbes Riley over there, she lives in this area, she's got great energy, she's always looking for products. So, you know, if you can productize things around her and things around some of these celebrities, that's what, what, what I do is when I meet somebody, I figure how can I productize that person? Like when I met 50 Cent, the rapper, I said, Hey, Beats by Dr. Dre, it's a billion dollar company now, why don't we do headphones? And that's what we did, put them on QVC and sold a ton. So productization, very important. And these are the top 10 things that I look for in a product. And many of you as inventors, this is probably, you know, born inside of you, but I'm just gonna mention them, is I look for a mass market item that solves a problem and it's unique enough that this is an important step, this uniqueness. It's unique enough such that there's nothing already solving the problem in a similar fashion. That's important. Number four is, is there a magical transformation you can create with that product? Can you get a celebrity endorsement? And there's ways to do celebrity endorsements without spending a lot of money. Um, I didn't get 50 cent a dime. Um, we didn't give Jack LaLanne any money. We didn't, you know, some of these celebrities want money. There's ways to turn them around, give them a little equity or something like that. Um, is there, can you create multifunctionality out of the product? Um, is if, if it's a single function product, the first thing that's going to happen, your competitor is going to say, how do I knock that off by making it more functions and the same price? So think like your knockoff competitor from day one. And... Can you get credible testimonials? Documentation and clinical studies are very important. I don't care what kind of product, whether it's a cleaning product or a fitness product, they're gonna to wanna to see proof that what you're claiming to demonstrate is actually for real. And they're gonna want a product testing lab certificate or something like that. So get and plan for that. Uh, publicity, PR, we're gonna talk about that in our fourth step here in a second. So I'm going to hold on that, but value proposition and cost of goods, you've got to give tremendous value, and that's the old but wait, there's more uh, a concept, and so uh, um, they always want to buy now and get something else at the right cost of goods. So uh, let's move on to profile, because I said 
publicity is important, and this is an important place where I say old media is very expensive. You know, you got to pay Rupert Murdoch. He's a multi-billionaire. So when you go on old media, it's a few channels broadcasting to millions of people. And, you know, think about this. It took 38 years for radio to get to 50 million people. It took 13 years for TV to, to get to 30, 50 million people. It took four years for the Internet to get to 50 million people. Three years for the iPod to get to 50 million. Two years for Facebook to get to 50 million. But here's a guy that actually hijacked America, and he got to 1 billion people in six months. Okay? So this guy, how many have seen... Side the Gangnam guy. I mean, he just came in. How did he do it? By raising his profile, okay? And it's, it's not that tough, really. And, you know, this is by using new media, you now have millions of channels broadcasting to a few. So forget about old media, Rupert Murdoch, a few channels broadcasting to millions. You got millions of channels broadcasting to a few. Maximizing those channels can be powerful because big companies are having a harder time competing with the small guys now. Small is the new big. And I actually say, I, I owned a studio just around the corner from here. It's 32,000 square feet. It's right on Meyer Lake. It's almost a baseball throw from here. Bought it, paid millions of dollars for it about six, seven years ago. And inside were seven cameras, five edit suites, and this cell phone right here does better video than those cameras did for millions of dollars a few years back. So you can, there's many people shooting infomercials on a daily basis right in their homes, beaming them up to these millions of channels that I talked about. Here's a guy that does 810 million views because he just tells people what mattered to me today. And this guy is making millions. This girl, Michelle Fawn, has 580 million views because she talks about how Asian girls can put on makeup. And she has a seven-figure sponsorship behind her. And here's a girl, Jenna Marbles, that she says, how to trick people into thinking you're good-looking, all right? That's pretty clever. And I have a 15-year-old son. He sat in the audience one day and says, I know Jenna Marbles. He's, he follows her on the Internet. She's got over a billion views. And this is because... She's broadcasting millions of channels to a few people. She's out there networking herself into the marketplace. And a lot of people say, but who, who's going to watch me? Who would want me on TV or on the Internet? And I'll tell you this right now. The Snuggie was one that sat in the corner of All Stars office for 18 months before they decided to do the project. And if a blanket with arms can become a TV sensation, anybody's product here can do the same, okay? Trust me. Um, so Scott Boylan, you know, a, a good friend of mine, All-Star Marketing, great company, 18 months it sat in their corner, and they finally decided to put it on the air. And guess what? $400 million in sales on a blanket with arms. So, uh, but, but the point I'm making here, TV started the campaign, but they went viral. They got Al Roker wearing it. They got Jay Leno wearing this. They got Ellen DeGeneres. They, they started pub crawls. They started viral activity, and they did it all with just little phones like this right here. And, and it's an amazing business plan that they executed, but it was very, very successful. So the, the, the last skill before we talk about the, scum, the stumble is partnerships, and I believe in partnerships for sure. And I think this is where I talk about partnerships. I've had, and I mentioned, partnerships that you guys can have because, you know, who woke up today with the resources that you want? I try to form partnerships in my business, like Guthy Ranker created Proactive. It's a billion-dollar product. And on a billion dollars, they got all these other beauty and skincare products, Cindy Crawford and... Uh, Victoria Principal, they are the gurus of skincare. I, I was in the, the hard goods side of the business. Fitness products, gadgets, juicers, walks, handheld blenders, kitchen products. So I took all of my skincare products, 
and we formed a venture. They took all their hard good products and we formed a 50-50 joint venture. And that was, was a company that we formed and we had 10 products, five from us, five from them. We partnered together and we both learned we'd made very big success on these projects together. And this was one of my biggest competitors. So think about who can you partner with. You can partner with factories. You can partner maybe with an engineer who might do the engineering for a piece of the action, for a little piece of the profits, for a quarter a unit sold, something like that. Um, you know, it's there's many people along the way that will partner with you possibly as opposed to you having to write that check. And the stumble is the one thing that I said, I can't just stand here and just talk about all these great things and I've had a lot of success, but I have also been right down to the bottom at the same time. And I've, you know, I was talking about a case study earlier up at MIT where they, where I had the, the rise, the fall, and the rise of Kevin Harrington, one of my companies. And, you know, it's, it's not fun to fall. And the guy, Sir Winston Churchill, he says, everybody's gonna do this because really success is going from failure to failure without the loss of enthusiasm, okay? So it's hard to be enthused when you fail, that's for sure. But this is how I look at it. Let me, uh-oh, I think we lost some audio. Um, okay, so um, Chubby Checker was, and I, I have to show you, one of my major failures. This was called the Twistisizer, okay? So, um, it, the, um, I don't know where the audio went, guys, but um, uh, that's okay. So, we remember the song. Yeah, so the, um, um, so Chubby Checker, when he came to me, I said, wait a minute, I should have known, a fitness product with a guy named Chubby, okay? So, you know, um, you know I, I lost a half a million dollars, all right? Um, and the, you know, here's Billy May's first infomercial. It's not going to make any sense because you can't hear, but you know what happened, Wayne? Um, I just got a couple more clips and I'm wrapping up. I... Was there moments ago? Ah. Some reason it went down to mute. Okay. Here's Billy Mays. Thanks for inviting me. I'd like to introduce to you the Washmatic International. It's the only washing system in the world that works direct from a bucket. Who cares, right? I mean, that was, that was, and by the way, without audio, you don't understand how bad that was, okay? So um, that was my first infomercial with Billy. That was Billy's first infomercial, and it was a huge bomb. And, you know, we were like, you know, Arnold Morris said, but Billy, he's the guru, you know? And I'm like, I didn't see it in that show, you know? So, but, you know, this, this is the point of, of, of failure, is that, you know, you, you know, Tony Little even hit bottom. After we did $300 million, he was in an accident, and he said, Kevin, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm done. He got so lethargic. He gained all his weight. He lost that Tony Little spirit. And, you know, you know I said, Tony, no. You have to get up. You've got to kick yourself back up into high gear because we fail more than we succeed. But we, we fail three out of four times. But what we really do is now and then we really, really succeed. And that is the key. And that's why when I said that to Tony and I said that to my team, because we had had failure, 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 and we were at the bottom. And then we went back and we said, okay, let's go back. We're going to go back with Billy. And let's hear to tell you more. Here's Billy's Mark last Billy infomercial. Mays and Anthony Sullivan. Anthony Sullivan. The dual saw is no ordinary saw. It uses counter-rotating technology to cut through all types of material with unmatched safety, speed, and precision. It's a process that took eight years and cost millions of dollars to develop. 
Until now, this technology has only been available for industrial purposes. That was the power. That was the perfect pitch. That was the Billy Mays. We shot that just right up here in my studio just um, a few years ago. That was Billy's last infomercial. And God bless, when he died, he had over 60 spots that he had successfully put on television. So um, Billy came back. Yes, he had. He, he didn't give up. And I'm working my Tony buttocks. Little. <laughs> I'm lean forward. I'm uh -huh. working my chest. I'm working my triceps. I'm working the back of my calves. And I'm working my heart. And I'm working my lungs. Over one billion in sales, Tony Little. So that was the gazelle. Tony didn't give up. In fact, Tony lives in this area. He's one of my best buddies. He is on HSN. You'll see him all the time. He's got a food line. He's got bison. He's got low carb pastas. He's got high protein cheesecakes. He's got massaging chairs. He's an unbelievable machine and he didn't give up either. In fact, every day that I think that I may be wondering what can I do, I listen to Tony Little, because this is what Tony always says. You'll see him say this on HSN all the time. You can do it. Okay. <laughs> all right. That's how I live my life, guys. And it's, it's been a pleasure to be here. This is a card that I carry with me. And I just want to finish by saying that life's battles don't always go to the fastest or the strongest. Sooner or later, those who win are those who think they can. And this is my beat up little card that I carry. So I hope every one of you has this same mentality because... It's not always easy. You don't always succeed on the first take. And just keep trying. And Wayne, I want to thank you guys for having me today. It's been a pleasure. Wasn't it great? All right. Not to be outdone. Kevin, Kevin is the warm act, warm up act. No. <laughs> ACOS and John Creeman uh, have a, a terrific, terrific program that they put on the radio every week helping inventors. Gentlemen, would you please come up and tell us everybody about the project? Thank you. So, let me introduce myself. I'm ACOS, Jen Kira, and this is John Creeman's. Uh, I'll say a little bit about John here. Standing here in front of you is a man who has had more live television hours than anyone in the United States of America. That includes Jay Leno. That includes Letterman. I think you have to add them together, most of them, to get his live television hours. That would be, be over 30,000 live hours. 30,000 live television hours and billions and billions of sales and tens of thousands of products. On Just over two billion. Two, oh, sorry. Yeah. Two billion? <laughs> yeah. Two billion dollars. Not sure exactly how many hundreds of thousands over. But You've seen him on it. HSN. He's actually a pioneer in, in, in the Home Shopping Network. And He's actually, yeah, not only that, but the first Home Shopping Network that I ever worked for was out of Menards. John Menards, who has uh, home centers much like Lowe's and Home Depot, his son's a NASCAR. He started back when HSN started a, a little shopping network called America's Value Network. That man right there came and bought that network many, many, many years ago. That'd be almost 26, 27 years ago, just when I was leaving to go to another shopping network, but by a finger hunt. But now I own the trademark and, and the channel, not channel, but the, the website is up, americasvalue.network.com. So if you haven't seen, it's cool, but that's, I remember him when he came to the uh, the yeah. building. <laughs> so if you haven't seen John Creamans, you're not watching television. Yeah. So cool yeah. that. Um, myself, I'm an inventor, just like you guys. I have several patents. My most recent success is something called laundry sheets. It's in 40,000 retail stores right now. Um, prior to this, uh, I wrote and helped produce the Abra infomercial, which was 120 million dollars last year. I think the combined sales are tipped over 200 million dollars now, and it's an international success. Uh, that show, just to reiterate what Kevin said, we shot for 38,000 bucks. Right here, downtown St. Pete. We shot that in a little store, and uh, the results of that were astronomical. It was basically a sports bra that offered a little support and, uh, and, and really resonated with the audience. So, so that, that, that type of success uh, happens rarely, but uh, when it does, it's a really great ride. So John and I, we were uh, being an inventor, and we've been around thousands of inventions and uh, on live shopping, and and in all the traitors. I actually remember Billy Mays. I met Billy in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, at the Pacific National Exhibition, when his nickname was Bucket Billy. And you saw why his nickname was Bucket Billy. He was a trade show guy just like me, and uh, we grew up together at the trade shows, and he hit it really, really big. And uh, I guess we cut your teeth at trade shows. And one of the reasons when I always talk to inventors, I always tell them, go to the trade shows. Buy space at a booth. Stand in front of your clients. Pitch that product over and over and over again. Accumulate 10,000 hours of doing that. Because when you do that, 
you get really good at it. When you get really good at it, you have a better chance of success. So I'm a trade show guy myself, so, and that's where if you look at the infomercial business, a lot of the guys who've come from trade shows, you know, Anthony Sullivan one, Billy Mays, um, it's a great place to learn, and there's so many good trade shows. Uh, Kevin talked about it himself. He still attends trade shows like everybody else. You should all do that. Stand in front of those customers. Stand in front of those booths and work and work and learn your pitch that way. Yeah, much like what you're doing here today. Yeah, it's much like what you're doing here today. So John and I were walking through a couple years ago uh, with our backgrounds, and we're getting gray and older and wiser and you know, slower. And we thought, you know, we were at the houseware show, I believe. And they had that invention thing in the houseware show. And everybody was all together. And we met, we met the greatest people. We met people who'd spent every last dollar they had on their invention. They had mortgaged their homes. They had, they had everything. They were so passionate. I mean, I couldn't stop listening. I mean, how passionate the people were, much like you guys. Very passionate people, very committed to their project. And we watched them. I mean, you know, we, you know, we walked through them. We have a lot of experience. I turned to John and I said, oh my gosh, we need to build a forum for these people. We need to do it for free. We need never to charge them anything. They need a voice, they need a platform to come on and talk to America. So it started, we, there at dinner, then we went to Rosebud's. Yes, we did. Had a big stick with a big bone in it. And uh, that we could use as a weapon after we were done. Yeah. We, we came up with the, 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 the radio show called My Cool Inventions. And if you ever, ever heard about it, go to mycoolinventions.com. It started here in Tampa, 970 WFLA. We since moved to 860, but we started right there on one station. And that one station grew to more stations. Today, there we're in 26 major markets. We just got signed by two syndicating companies, Genesis and the Business Radio Talk Network. By Christmas, we should be on a couple hundred stations. And our current audience today is roughly a quarter million people every Saturday listen to us between 4 and 7. That is on real radio, that's on their stations and their cars, listening. It's funny because I was talking to, I won't tell you who, but big industry executive in life shopping, big marketing guy. And I was asking them to sponsor our radio show, because that's how we make money. That's how we pay the bills. We don't ever charge inventors anything. We charge these advertisers and the sponsors who you hear on our show. Uh, that's who pays for the show. And I wanted this guy sponsorship. It was a big television shopping channel. I won't tell you which one, but there's only a couple. And I said, uh, you got to sponsor the show. We got all these thousands of inventors. They got such great product. You got to put them on your radio. You got to put them on your eight. You know, I can't tell you the name of this shopping channel. But you got to put them on the show. You got to give them some overnight time. We got to give these guys a break. I was sitting there telling my pleading audience. And he says to me, he goes, so how many people listen to your show anyways? Oh, good news. That's measured by Arbitron. It's called average quarter hour listeners. I go, we have you know quarter million people at any given 15 minute period between four and seven o'clock who are tuned into our radio station. Now I'll ask you a question. How many people are actually watching your live shopping channel on Saturday between four and seven o'clock? I got the 93 million household pitch. I go, no, no, I don't wanna hear the households you're in because I don't even know how many cars we could potentially be in, but it's big. How many really are listening? He goes, I can't tell you that, but guess. I said, I'll tell you what, I've been on live shopping for 20 years, you've been on for more? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I said, and even though I'm the youngest one. Yes, I know. Yeah. He said, uh, between 50,000 to 250,000, depending on the time of day, that's who are really watching. And your competitor, twice that. He looked white. He goes, my gosh, you have no clue how close you are. I go, does that mean that our radio show has about the audience you do on a Saturday afternoon between 4 and 7 o'clock? People are listening because they love you guys. They love entrepreneurs. This country loves invention spirit. They love it, they listen to it. So here's the format of the show. John is the genius behind it. He did the website, did all the, we hired the, the, the texting company that does American Idol to take votes, and the premise of the show was this. We're not the sharks, the audience is. We just host the show. You come onto our show and you pitch to our audience, and they vote. They choose their favorite. They choose their favorite by text, they choose their favorite by internet, they choose their favorite. Most of them text. Often wondered during their car texting, but Yeah, we always tell them to pull over first before they do that. They text and they choose, and the winner moves on. Well, they use DECA text. 
And they, Decatex. Yeah, yes. they can do it faster. By the way, Wayne was on the Saturday. We broadcast that show live from Las Vegas. And he was on. He needs your vote. So text everybody, go to their cell phone right now, and you text the 22333. That's the number you text to, and you text the word Decatex. So D E C A T X T. Because he's got another inventor chasing him, and he needs to move on because the winner this year will win a $50,000 grand prize marketing package. It's that's, a thousand, that's a thousand ads across all of our, our broadcast media so that we can give them the biggest splash they can when they bring their product out, or at least you know, to bring in, uh, investors or whatever right. to their product. So that's what we do. You go to mycoolinventions.com, you submit your product. We uh, don't put you on the air unless you're protected. And when you're not protected, we set you up with that lady in the middle there, Susie Martini. We ask her to help you guys. And uh, you come on air and you pitch your product. Speaking of Kevin's pitch, that's a good place to learn how to pitch it. We've had all kinds of great pitches, haven't we? Yeah, we've, and we've had some bad ones. Yeah, that's true. We had one guy that actually was, was on, he was ready to go. We can talk to him a little bit about his invention, had all the background. Because what we, we try to do is we try to get not just the pitch of the product. We want to know yeah. what the inventive process was, how long it took them to get from you know, that aha moment uh, when they told their friends and family to where they actually have a final prototype or a product. So we want to know the backstory too. Because I think that's, it's kind of important. And then you also learn from that because then you learn from their mistakes and you know, the things that have happened that have been good to them. Tell but we had one guy, yeah, it was a drum product. He was a, you can change the heads on a drum faster than anything. So he gets on, he's ready to go. We give him the music sounds, we tell him to go and start his pitch, and he's and like, he well. And he threw up. I'm like, oh, I got I got I got it. It wasn't television, it was just radio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we heard it. I wish we would have had that on Skype. That's and coming we, in next, you know, next, and next season. And we have fantastic pitches. And we have, people have come back for the Genesis program, so we've heard people's pitches over and over again now, and they're getting better and better and better. So that's what you do. You come on for a minute, you pitch, and uh, what happens is that the customers like you, listeners like you, you move on to the next round, and if you move on to the next round, today, this year, on December 12th, we'll give away a $50,000 grand prize package, and immediately behind that, we'll start Genesis 2, which will be our second season, our competition, and there's a rumor going around we might throw around a $100,000 prize next year. Okay? So that's not nothing, right? And I don't, and anybody been on the show? Has anybody been on our show? There's one, there's a few of you been on our show. Have we ever charged you anything for the show? Mm -hmm. We never charge you anything. That's kind of the try we're trying to get through by doing that, right? The second thing we started this year is because um, all of the invention submissions, and we've had, I don't know, 1,200 or something just for the Genesis program? Yeah, yeah for, for Genesis, about 1,200. So as the Genesis program started, we had so many people who need funding. Who needs funding? Who doesn't need funding? <laughs> I should have done that, right? And I thought, this is crazy. Because, you know, you can't pay for a patent lawyer, you can't pay for a prototype, you can't pay for all that stuff unless you have some money in your pocket. And most, most inventors I've met have deeply invested in their project, way past even reasonability sometimes. The Black & Decker Beauty Kit wasn't a very good one, was it? No, oh. no, no. <laughs> Something about orange and black on the outside of a case. The whole sanding thing wasn't good. So we thought we have to come up with a platform to raise money. Of course, there's all kinds of platforms out there. There's a Kickstarter. Indiegogo. Indiegogo. There's a few of them, right? And I thought, what should we do? This, by the way, this doesn't cost nothing to set up a crowdfunding site. I know. I was paying the bill. He was programming it with all his programmers. It was crazy. At one point, a couple times I wanted to give up. Actually. It was twice I said, forget it, I'm yeah. done, can't do it. But we did it. We created a crowdfunding site called My Invent Fund. And here's the deal. It's not different than any other crowdfunding sites. In fact, most crowdfunding sites are probably better, better audience, Kickstarter is probably the best. But what we do for you, we'll put you on the radio, in front of a quarter million listeners who love you. And then we'll ask them to donate. That's what we do. The best way to get donations, though, is to reward, as you know from crowdfunding, is to reward the listening. Where's the Pammy pocket lady? You're perfect for it. Because you can give away a $20 Pammy pocket for every $20 donation, right? Get you on the radio, tell everybody that. So you pitch your product, you ask for money, and a little secret we tell you. I don't know if you've been listening to the show, but frequently we'll match the donation for nothing. That comes out of our pocket. 
So we're trying to raise money for the Inventors too. So my Invent Fund, it's in its baby stages. You just, you'll see it just started. It's only a few projects up there. Some of them are not going very well, right? But we have to teach the inventor what to do. We have to teach you to reward the donor with a decent reward. I was watching uh, Two Broke Girls the other night. Did you watch that? They did, a, they did a crowdfunding site. And they gave, for the $500 donation, you got the slapper in the face. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to do that, but you want to give them something, right? So, so come up with a great marketing program that attracts investors. That's usually giving them your product. How would, how, imagine if, imagine if the, you know, Steve Jobs came. And he, he gave away a signed copy of his latest invention. Wouldn't that be worth something today? You know, be innovative. Be thinking. Raise the money and fulfill, fulfill your dreams. One of the things, the things I want to tell you, I just came back from the Electronic Retailing Association. There is a new trend out there that I'm noticing. There are a couple of companies to do it. One of our sponsors does it. Uh, you'll see it on our website, mycoolinventions.com. Permission Interactive is one of our sponsors. And they web test um, your product before you spend any money. So they take your idea and web test it. Um, they have 100,000 people they go to, they ask a questionnaire, and what they do is, I actually had dinner with the guy and I challenged him, I go, you can't predict a hit. And he admitted they can't predict a hit, but what they can do is predict a failure. They predict a failure really well. So, so what you can do is you can go there and you try to predict a hit, and of course, it, if it comes out you know, that it doesn't stand much of a chance, it's a really good place to sort of put your finger in the tone of the water before you spend too much money. So there are some tools that are coming out of this internet age that also help inventors. My Invent Fund, maybe you want to put your finger in the tone of the water to measure the temperature. Yeah. My Cool Inventions Radio, come pitch your, it doesn't cost you anything. The only thing you can do is maybe move on and win, right? Mm -hmm. Or throw up. <laughs> <laughs> But we have a lot of fun. We have a really a lot of fun. It's uh, you know it costs us a lot of money to do. I think it's my current budget. I think we spend over twenty. We lose about twenty thousand a month doing the show, right? Yeah. yeah. And it just you know I just I feel like we just we're doing it because we're trying to give back, and we're we're doing it because we feel that one day we'll hit a tipping point, and there'll be not two hundred and fifty thousand people listening, but a couple million people listening, and maybe a TV show spins out of it. You know, we are TV guys, right? So we're hoping yeah. to build our audience that way, and we're investing, and we're investing in you guys. We're investing in you guys' future, and we're hoping we create great entertainment for America. Listen, America's not where it's supposed to be. You guys are the future. Small business is the dream. The American dream is not dead. You heard Kevin, and you know I got I got excited. You know I, I needed that. You know I used to work with a guy, and I needed that little kick in the pants sometimes. Get you excited. And he does a great job at that, and it's not dead. All you have to do is step up. You know, come on the show. Go to Michael Inventions Radio or MichaelInventions.com and submit your product. Talk to us. Need a product sourcing person? Anybody use any of our product sourcing leads? Anybody? We use Ginger and stuff. Anybody like that? We never charge for that. We don't charge any of our services. We're not a consulting company. We don't charge you anything. That we're trying to keep it forever. It's just people that we have dealt with over our our career and over our years in the industry, and people that we trust. Because that's a big thing. I think um, one of the things and one of the reasons we started this whole show. Because we knew people, we heard the stories of people being taken advantage of. And there are a lot of them. And actually one that actually came to our studio before a show, because ACOS invited him, and he took us on a path and a journey that was so sad. We gave up our will to live, forgot about doing the show. I'm like, what? He were three minutes of the show. And the light went on, like, we were going, we could Just take me out of here right now. Make John said, don't ever do that again. No. <laughs> it's just, it was sad. It was, it so was whatever we can do to help the inventor and to help you guys is what we're trying to do. Whether it's through education, because we bring people on the show. Mm -hmm. We've had Kevin on the show before. Yeah, We've Kevin had other great. people from uh, from other associations and other, you know, just pe people that are in the business that might be able to teach you a few things uh, and give you ideas and maybe you never get a chance to talk to them or hear from them, but at least they'll be on our show. Um, and then also from the other inventors, because we try to give, after every inventor gives a pitch and every, uh, every inventor has their story, we try to give them a little bit of what our knowledge into what their pitch should be. So we can take our pitch crafting, and if we can make it better for them, by the time they leave the show, and they're able to go out and do some things. Pammy actually did the same thing with hers, uh, with some suggestions that I gave her. Um, I think that it, it, that's what we're about. And it's all a give back for us. When we made our money, we've been successful. We've been very fortunate, God, thank, you know, thank God. But um, if we can help just one inventor, one innovation, one American at a time, that's what we're about. 
and that's what we're going to continue to do. And you guys are amazing. 30 years. When I, when I listened to that, I thought to myself, holy moly, that's longer than I've been in the business. Yeah. And I thought I'd been in the business forever. It was like black and white television. Who's still in the cradle? <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations. That's one heck of accomplishment. I'm actually wondering, we've been to a lot of inventors council, uh, uh, workshops and a lot of inventors groups. You guys might be the oldest in the country, aren't you? No? Amongst the top tier, though. Well, Minnesota's got a really old. It's, it's incredible what you guys are doing. It's absolutely incredible. So keep up the great work. And thank you very much for having us. And remember, you text the word DECATEXT, D-E-C-A-T-X-T, -E to 22333 to help that guy right there. <laughs> Who's chasing you? You've got some pillow pocket. The pillow winning. packet. Yeah, yeah. Pillow packet. You're winning right now, right? Uh, just but only by a little bit. bit. Yeah. So help the guy, because he has to go on to the next round, because apparently with his invention, you can actually achieve telekinesis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I he, heard it on the radio. He okay. said it, yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't the fog of Las Vegas when we heard it, so we know. <laughs> So God bless you guys all, and thank you very Thanks much for the questions. Helping inventors succeed, and, and really that's, that was the founding of the organization in the first place, was to give inventors a, a chance. Um, inventors come up with a great idea and they say, oh, well, this would be neat, now what? And, uh, you know, what do you do? Maybe you, maybe you build one in the garage and and you tinker with it, and then what? You know, maybe the wife uses it, maybe, uh, maybe you use it, but that's not, that's not what it's all about. What it's all about is being successful with it. And so, in order to achieve that success, we try to bring like minds together, inventors that have had experience, inventors that are going through the process, um, to teach a little bit about protecting an idea, advancing an idea, building a decent prototype, writing a, a marketing plan, and getting the product out there. And, um, and so it was 30 years ago that uh, a gentleman sitting right over here, Ron Smith, decided that, um, that inventors needed to, uh, to have a place where they could get together, and organize, and work together. And uh, I'd like to welcome Ron Smith to come and tell us a little bit about his journey, his path, the past, and uh, where he sees uh, invention going. Ron, would you please join us? I'm, limp I'm limping because I walked uh, six miles the other night and I shouldn't have done that. But trying to lose a little bit of weight and you know how that is get too enthusiastic, you walk too far, you start limping. Um, funny thing happened on my way to give this talk because uh, I've spoken, I'm not a professional speaker as the three people before us, of course, so I'm going to show you what a non-professional speaker is like. Uh, but uh, I have given a few seminars back in uh, the early days of the small, well, 30-some years ago. Uh, who was the fellow who ran the Small Business Development Center at USF? It was Bill something with the letter M. Do I recall him? He was the Small Business Development Center guy. He said the seminars we had on patents, I appear before groups, something like this, said they were the most popular seminars they had of all the USF seminars. And USF is holding seminars on gazillions of topics. But the best attended ones were always the one on patents. And that's when they started thinking about patent consciousness, realizing that the Tampa Bay area of Florida was a place where a patent lawyer could actually stay busy. Uh, they were actually shocked that we were busy and had so much work to do that we were working around the clock. Um, so that was my only experience really as a public speaker was talking to these seminars we had at the USF Small Business Development Center. So the funny thing that happened to me on the way here was that I always gave a standard talk called Patent Basics, and it was for people like yourselves who were getting into the patent system, because I discovered that almost every client I had coming in the door had all kinds of crazy misconceptions about the patent system. I mean, it was just unbelievable how upside down people are, not realizing how the system works. So I 
developed a talk over the years called Patent Basics, where I would go through a lot of the do's and don'ts and surprise people with a lot of the stuff that they thought was true that wasn't true and all that. So I thought, that's what I'll do. Since I've uh, asked to speak at the 30th anniversary, I'll give my Patent Basic talks. So I sent that to Wayne, and he says, excellent talk. I really like that talk. I've read it over. It covers a lot of good information. Don't give it. He said, it'd be a fine talk for a regular meeting of the Tampa Bay Inventors Council, but on this particular occasion, it's the 30th anniversary of the club. I want you to instead talk about why did you form the club? How did it come about? What is the history of this club? How did it get started? We want to learn more about you, Ron, where you come from, and all that kind of stuff. You know. So I took my prepared remarks that I've used for many, many years, tossed them out the window, and said, OK, I'll give a talk, a, a different talk. And then I started chuckling to myself, because I remembered the old Mary Tyler Moore show where, um, this goes back to the 70s, right? Mary Tyler Moore. They had an episode where they were going to do an awards dinner for the producer of the show. And there was a guy on the show who was the weather guy, I believe. His name was Ted Baxter. And he thought everything was about himself. So when the awards dinner came and he was asked to say a few words, he was, they expected him to get up and say, you know, it's really great working for Mr. So-and-so, the producer of our show. But he, being the very self-centered guy, thought it was all about him. And it was a very funny episode where he walks up to the podium and says, it all began in a small 5,000-watt radio station in Dayton, Ohio. Because he, he thought the world revolved around him, and he thought this is all. So when, so when Wayne said, we want to learn about you, I thought, OK, I'll walk up to the podium. And I'll say, it all began <laughs> in a small West Virginia town. Uh, I grew up in West Virginia, and the other day a fellow asked me, by the way, where are you from? I said, West Virginia. He says, no, 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 you said that wrong. I said, oh, yeah, you're right. West, by God, Virginia. That's the way you have to say it. And then I went to college down in Tennessee at the University of Tennessee and got my industrial engineering degree back in 1969. Worked a couple years as an industrial engineer at Kimberly Clark in their Kleenex factory in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, then I worked for about a year in a power company. And from there, I went to the University of Florida Law School in 1971. So I've been in Florida since 1971. And once I finished law school, I started practicing as a general practice lawyer. I graduated in 73, took the bar exam in 74. Uh, started practicing as a general practice lawyer. How many of you were here back in around 1970? Wow, what year was that? Around 75, when the guy was arrested for killing all those uh, greyhound dogs out at Derby Lane. That was my first jury trial. I was a young general practice lawyer, hadn't taken the patent bar exam yet. This guy walks in, he's been arrested for killing 50 greyhound dogs. He plugged them into the wall and killed them all. Uh, it's a long, long story, but that was my first jury trial. And he was found not guilty. And my smiling face was on the front page of the St. Pete Times for, you know, uh, he was found not guilty of killing those dogs, even though he was, in fact, guilty. Uh, and he went to prison on a different matter, and he escaped from there and went back to prison for escaping from prison. One of these people that you just can't help, you know. But after three years of uh, general practice type of stuff, I went through six jury trials, and the first five were all not guilty verdicts. Uh, the sixth one, I finally got somebody convicted. Uh, I think it was F. Lee Bailey in the introduction to his book. He said, uh, F. Lee Bailey's book, uh, The Defense, Never Rest, I think it is. He said, as a young lawyer, I made lots of mistakes, and innocent people went to jail. But as an older lawyer, I got better, and a lot of guilty people went free. So in the long run, it all averaged out. Everything worked out for good. So after three years of doing general practice type of stuff, and going into the jail and interviewing my clients, and asking a guy how come he didn't have any toes on his feet, and he would say, well, a cop shot him off. After three years of that, other lawyers were saying to me, aren't you an engineer? Didn't you have an engineering degree? How come you're not a patent lawyer? What are you doing in criminal court all the time defending these criminals? 
So I don't know. They just walked into the door and you know, they'd been arrested. And I said, okay, I'll do it. You know, so I did a lot of jury trials. But other lawyers were saying, really, with an engineering degree, man, you know, right now you're defending criminals. You could be a patent lawyer. Why don't you do that? So after about three years of general practice, I took the patent bar exam and passed it. And surprisingly, as soon as I passed the exam, I didn't really think anything special would happen, but I got a call from a Miami law firm that was looking for a young patent lawyer, somebody who had just passed the exam, and apparently they published these things of who passed it. And went to that law firm, and one of their big clients was the Popeil brothers. You guys mentioned Ron Popeil. And the first job that Ron Popeil gave me was on the pocket fisherman. That was a plastic thing that you could fold up and stick in your glove compartment. And a firm in Taiwan was copying it, and they were sending leaflets, flyers. This was way before internet days. They were sending flyers to various retailers saying, the pocket fisherman is coming soon. And it was you know, going to be less price, I guess, than the Popeil brothers. So he came into the Miami firm, and I got to meet him, and he said, uh, one of the Popeil brothers. And uh, so I was given the assignment of stopping the shipment of pocket fishermen knockoffs from Taiwan. It was on the famous slow boat from China. So I caught a flight to Washington, D.C. I first of all prepared the complaint. You have to file a complaint with the International Trade Commission. Actually, it's called the United States International Trade Commission. Uh, setting forth, you know, attaching copies of this flyer that the pocket fisherman was on its way and all that kind of stuff. And the International Trade Commission issued an order for the Customs Department to seize that boat when it arrived. I think it was in Long Beach, California. And sure enough, the Customs Department did seize it. And Mr. Popeil was very happy. And it was really kind of funny because we looked at the, uh, the knockoffs that they had copied. He had made a engineering design mistake on the pocket fisherman when you opened up one of the hinges it's kind of counterintuitive and people were breaking the hinge it should have been the other way the hinge should have been on the left instead of the right or vice versa I forget what it was and the Taiwan copier had also copied the mistake so he thought that was kind of funny that they didn't put any redesigning of any kind it was just a complete and total copy well my wife is from Taiwan so in I think it was the August of 1979 we went to go visit her parents in Taiwan, and I thought, why don't I go and check on these guys? Uh, it'd be interesting to see face to face the people who were the uh, recipients of this uh, thing being seized and all that kind of stuff, you know. So I got, a, got the address written in Chinese and took a taxi to the gas place, and it was a great big gigantic factory. I mean, they had stuff, they were making stuff like crazy. And I asked the reception if I could meet with the fella, and I had the letter that I had written early on before his product had been seized and everything. He came out, and he was absolutely terrified. <laughs> he took me to the back of the room, and he showed me the molds where the pocket fisherman had been made. Somebody had taken a sledgehammer to it. And while I was there, he says, we have destroyed these molds. Let me show you. And he gets out the sledgehammer and he gave it a few more whacks, <laughs> just for good measure. And that's how I learned that patent infringement in Taiwan is a criminal offense. He thought after we had been through this seizure of his product and customer, that I had traveled all the way from Miami to follow up and make sure that he, and he thought I might be sending him to jail, so he was showing me how we have destroyed these things. So. The point of all this is, with your U.S. patent, you can stop people from importing stuff. You know, you worry about people making it in China and all these other places and importing it. If you can find out what they're doing, you can stop them in their tracks. The Trade Commission operates very quickly. The Customs Department is very fast. In Tampa, they are seizing stuff on a daily basis. Sometimes they take stuff too fast. They're very quick on the draw. I've had clients who were completely legitimate, had their property from China seized just because it came from a certain port that they're very suspicious of. And then they have to explain, this is not really an infringing article. This is coming. This is okay. So they are very, very vigilant. So if you have a patent in the United States, that could be really all you need. It's very expensive to patent overseas, obviously. Okay, so all this talk, 
I'm in Miami. Uh, my wife wanted to move back to the Tampa Bay area, so we did after just a couple of years down in Miami. And, but I was still a baby lawyer. This was uh, in the early 80s. And I got a call from the Central Florida Inventors Council. Uh, one of these gentlemen was asking, is this the oldest? No. Uh, we even stole our name from the Central Florida Inventors Council. That's where the name Tampa Bay Inventors Council came from. Uh, I got a call from a lady who was inviting me to come to Orlando and attend a meeting of the Central Florida Inventors Council. And I said, what is an Inventors Council? And they explained it to me. A lawyer in uh, Orlando named Bob Duckworth had started the Central Florida Inventors Council. And so I talked to him. He told me what a great thing it was and uh, that I should join, blah, blah, blah. I went to Orlando and had one of their, went to one of their meetings. It was very, very good. At that particular time, the all the rage was the Wally Wall Walker, which is a, a silly thing. You could throw it up against the wall and it would walk its way down and it came from Japan or something like that. And they were trying to get the guy who invented that to come and be a speaker. And I wasn't there. He was not a speaker when I was there. But they were talking about, they were inviting him to come and talk. That was all the rage in 83. So I thought, well, we can do this in Tampa. We can have a Tampa Bay Inventors Council. We don't have to drive all the way to Central Florida. And so really what I decided to do was uh, I noticed that most of my clients were very, very secretive, very uh, introverted. Uh, the first question often was, how do I know you're not going to steal my invention? And I would say, because no one wants to steal the opportunity to work for years and years and years without any guarantee of success, and that's why I'm not going to steal your invention. It's stealing the opportunity to you know, do what? And I, of course, would try to explain the attorney-client privilege and all that, that you don't need to worry. So but once we got through that, I got to thinking, all these people think they're the only inventor in Pinellas County. And they're running into so many problems. They would tell me that a tool and die shop had ripped them off, told them it was going to be $26 an hour, then they doubled their fees or they gave them really bad stuff. All kinds of problems. And I decided what we really ought to do to get this Inventors Council started, I'll just introduce all my clients to each other. I was a baby lawyer at that time. I had been a patent lawyer for about four years, and I had 400 clients at that time. Right now, I think it's 2,700, but back in those days, it was 400. And I thought, if I start calling 400 people, I'll be on the phone all day long. This is before we had internet email stuff. So I got a friend of mine, and I, he was a very active, is George Seibold here today? I don't think he is. Uh, but George was willing to start calling all these clients, and you're not allowed to give people your client list and all that kind of stuff. And I said, remember the staff, so I hired him, made him a secretary of the law firm, because secretaries, of course, they come in under the attorney-client privilege. So I made him an official secretary of the law firm, and his job paid him, and then your job is to call these people and I gave him names and phone numbers, and I did not tell anybody, I did not tell him what any of the inventions were, so there was no disclosures of any kind. But he started working on calling all 400 of my clients at that time, and he would start off introducing himself. I'm calling from the law office of Ron Smith, and I was just calling to ask, would you join an inventor's club if there was one? And he got a 100% yes. Uh, a few people would ask him, what is an inventor's club? And he would tell them what the Central Florida Inventors Council was doing, having speakers come in about marketing techniques and patent lawyers coming in, trying to get rid of all these old wives' tale, which are now called urban myths. Uh, so he would spend quite a bit of time on the phone with everybody. But it was a unanimous, we didn't have a single person who said, no, I'm not interested. Everybody was interested. So we decided, okay, let's pick out a place for our very first meeting. And I noticed in downtown Clearwater, the St. Pete Times has a, what was back in those days, a very modernistic building. Uh, you may have seen it downtown Clearwater. They got the vertical windmill turbine that sticks up in the air and they have all the earth pressed up against the walls of the building for uh, insulation purposes, the lower the air conditioning costs and all that kind of stuff. But that's a nice futuristic looking building be a good place to hold our first Tampa Bay Inventors Council meeting. And I had spent a lot of time in the St. Pete Times telling them that we're going to be doing this. 
because obviously we're going to be meeting in the St. Pete Times Clearwater office in a room that's probably about half the size of this one. Uh, and about 200 of the 400 people actually did show up that night. Uh, so one of the first questions I wanted to ask you guys tonight, is there anybody here back in 1983 who was at that particular building, downtown St. Petersburg, with the windmill sticking up and the dirt up against the walls, that particular building? I was just curious, does anybody from that very original meeting come here today? I don't see anybody raising their hands. I know a lot of you guys were here from the very beginning, been almost for 30 years, but apparently no one from the very, very first meeting made it. Uh, Mark Twain once said, I love to speak on subjects about which I know nothing, because then I don't have the facts to hold me back. <laughs> Since there is no one here from that first meeting, <laughs> Would you believe that when I founded the Tampa Bay Inventors Council, I was given a ticker tape parade through the canyons of Manhattan? <laughs> oh, you wouldn't believe that. Would you believe a ticker tape parade through St. Peter's? No. You're right, it was a thud. There was absolutely nothing happened. I was very disappointed at the first meeting. Well, I was very happy, of course, that a couple hundred people came out. We elected officers, we elected presidents, vice presidents, all that kind of stuff. We got really organized. We had corporate books. It was really a wonderful night. And it, I was thrilled because all these people I had known as individuals were now meeting each other for the very first time. The whole thing was bringing a bunch of inventors together and hoping that some synergy would occur because people could exchange information with each other about all the experiences they had had. And over the years, that's happening. We're seeing a lot of synergy going on. Even this morning, as we were just before the speakers began, I saw people exchanging business cards. We can do this, we can do that. There's a lot of cross-linking, cross-fertilizing, even at a meeting like this. But at that particular meeting, the reason I was disappointed was I had asked the St. Pete Times to cover the, now the Tampa Bay Times, to cover the event, and when I walked in and saw their reporter, my heart sank, and I realized, oh, rats. How many of you guys remember Joaquin Saunders? He was the St. Petersburg Time humor columnist. <laughs> they treated the whole thing as a joke. And the next morning, I get up to read the St. Pete Times, and it said, I went to the Inventors Club last night. The long-awaited very first meeting of the Tampa Bay Inventors Council. What a waste of time. I pulled into the parking lot. There wasn't a single car there with wings sticking out of it. I walked into the room. There wasn't a single person there wearing a beanie with a propeller sticking out of the top of it. I was expecting to see something really fabulous at the Tampa Bay Inventors Council. There was nothing there but ordinary people, ordinary cars, very truly yours, Joaquin Sanders. That was it. He just panned it, tried to make some really weak jokes out of it. And so I called the St. Pete Times up and I said, thank you very little. <laughs> this should have been treated by anybody except your humor columnist. The only people who read it, they know immediately that they're linking inventors with something that's stupid and wacky. And I really hate that impression that so many people have of inventors. Uh, a little seven-year-old granddaughter went to an acting show the other day. And I mean, she's in an acting class. And they were teaching them how to act like this. And the, the teacher says, to be a mad scientist, walk around going, ah, ah, ah. I thought, oh, come on now. <laughs> the public version of you know, how to act like a mad scientist or how to act like an inventor, all of these things are very negative. And I'm hoping that over the years, as the council has now become an institution and it's running itself, Wayne <laughs> uh, has an awful lot of help, of course, that he puts a tremendous amount of effort into this. And the other fellows, Kurt and all of them who work with him are doing a, an amazing amount of work. They have kept it going for over 30 years, which is pretty fantastic. It's been through 
a lot of metamorphosis and stuff. We started, uh, the first meeting was at the uh, public library, Largo Public Library. We picked the first and third Wednesday of each month, or the second and fourth. I think it might have been the second and fourth, but two weeks a month. And when we started, we had probably 30 or 40 people there coming on a regular basis, guys like uh, Bob Wheeler and PG were there, right? Uh, and Jack Goss. There's quite a few of the old fellows who are still with us, uh, who were there back in the early days. And we had a lot of speakers come in. You know, we did a lot of stuff, which is pretty much uh, still going, but that was before they had uh, internet and email and all that stuff. So our publicity was primarily through the St. Petersburg Times. We relied an awful lot on them for publicity. And over the years, we got a few uh, articles written that were not quite as bad as the uh, Joaquin Sanders put down. Uh, I've been ad living so far. I haven't looked at my notes that I was supposed to talk about. Uh, I'm going to skip a lot of this stuff because I see we're short on times and I'm short on time anyways. Uh, I would mention that there's an awful lot of variety that comes out of this club. Uh, we go from the simple mechanical to really serious industrial stuff, and there's some really heavy physics that have come out of this club, lasers and things like that. Uh, a lot of uh, surgical devices that uh, save people's lives. Uh, it's an amazing thing if you think about all the stuff that has come out of the inventors of Pinellas County. Uh, like when you put a stint in a person, for example, there's uh, debris that gets released and it flows downstream and it winds up in their heart, it winds up in their brain or something that causes a stroke. So one of the club members, uh, you've seen these little tiny umbrellas that they put in drinks, you can open up these little tiny, it kind of reminds me of that because his invention was you would go downstream of where the stint is going to be placed in it and you open up that little umbrella and then when the stint is in place and all the debris starts flowing, the debris gets caught by the umbrella, but the porosity of it allows the blood cells to keep on flowing through. Saved. Many people, many people who've had stents uh, didn't die because of that invention. And here in Pinellas County, you know, that's one. I have written 842 patents. I checked this morning at the USPTO.gov website. You can go and punch in any lawyer's name and you'll see how many patents they've done and they'll give a list of all the patents and you're, they're all still there. So I checked this morning, it's 842. I reached retirement age last week and decided I'll keep on going, why not? Uh, it's too much fun to quit. The uh, most fun people in the world to work with are inventors. I can't imagine still being a criminal, <laughs> a criminal who's smarter than I used to. It really makes me laugh when I think about it. What, how would I feel if I was, uh, if I had just hit retirement age and I'd been doing criminal defense all these years, I think I'd be ready to quit. When I met F. Lee Bailey, he was in his 50s and he was like this. His hand was shaking back and forth. The trial lawyers, uh, whatever they call it. And he would say, trial work is for a young man. I've been doing this too long. And he just, and trial lawyers have the shortest lifespan of any lawyers. Uh, they have the highest rate of alcoholism. They have the highest rate of uh, divorce. All the bad things come with being a trial lawyer. And I, after three years of that, I got out of that into the best part of law, which is working with inventors, which are the most creative and the nicest people in the world, which is pretty much the opposite of the people that I started my career with. <laughs> And did I leave out anything? I'm sure I left out a whole lot of stuff uh, because I've really been talking primarily off the cuff and ignoring my, uh, ignoring my notes. Let me say one other thing, though, just for inspiration purposes. I, uh, of those 842 patents, I don't know how many of those actually made money. When I was with the, really active with the Inventors Council and doing the newsletter, I would ask people who are members of the club to Write to me, let me know if you've had success, and I define success as making more money than you spent. You know, <laughs> spending 20000 making 10000 doesn't do it. And uh, it finally occurred to me that uh, it wasn't going to work out if all we were doing was sitting back and waiting for somebody who was 
uh, had made more money than uh, they had spent. And the reason I said that has completely escaped me. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I said there was one more thing. Here it is, here it is. The reason I said that is finally some of those people did in fact make money. Uh, one guy sold his patent uh, for $17 million. And a few weeks later, the same guy sold another patent for $4 million. So I have, out of those 842 patents, I know one guy who sold his patents for a total of $21 million. He didn't even take me out to lunch. Uh, I got paid about $5,000 per patent, which was shared, of course, with the law firm. We have 10 people in the Smith Hoping law firm. So it wasn't exactly like, you know, uh, but it can happen. This particular guy was approached by Pitney Bowes. They had seen his patents. Uh, they put his patents through a stress test. They decided they were solid. They couldn't think of a way to get around it. They admitted they had tried to think of ways to get around it. And then they asked me to come to work for them. And I was honored that they asked me to come to work for them. But I said, no thanks, I live in a nice warm place. I never even asked them where Pitney Bowes headquarters was because I figured it was up north someplace and I didn't want to live any further north than I already was. Um, and I think out of the 842 patents, there probably are a few more in there who made some money. Uh, I'm sure I'm looking at Peter right now, so I see Peter Bureau. There's a lot of guys who are successful. Randall sitting right beside him is, uh, as you know, very prolific. There's a lot of successful people here and thank you all for coming today. I probably have left out a lot of things I would have liked to have said, but I'm just very happy that the organization has survived all these years, that it's growing, that Wayne has worked so hard to keep it growing, and this is a magnificent facility. A facility. I walked in here and I thought, wow, I've lived in Pinellas County all these years, and I've never even seen this, I've never even been inside this building. You know what a fabulous place it is. And I think for the rest of the day, we're going to have people uh, showing their inventions, and that's gonna be really the fun part now that we're done with all the, I should say, all the boring speakers, the others were very good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Kirk, could you join me? Uh, would any of the uh, people that are members of the Tampa Bay Inventors Council please stand up? Ron? Yes? It is our privilege to honor you. Kirk? It all began in a small... <laughs> Ron, on behalf of, of not only uh, Wayne, our president, my, I'm Kirk, uh, the vice president. Uh, uh, we've got Mark over here as our treasurer. Uh, Rob back here, our secretary not just on behalf of this generation that's here, but we've had presidents and, and, and officers before us, and we hope that we have many to come after us. And I, incidentally, we're still all volunteer people. You know, we're, our names are thrown into the hat and we're elected. Uh, none of us are paid, and yet it's endured for 30 years, uh, for the most part going that way, and, and we hope that it continues. And if you read here, it says, inventors helping inventors pursuing their dreams. And uh, that is that is what you really have helped uh, Tampa Bay uh, do here uh, with... Uh, That's what I'm checking to see if it's clear. <laughs> I bought it in Clearwater. Yes. Okay. Beehive Awards, local product. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. And... Uh, we, we greatly do appreciate you starting this because it does uh, help us keep our dreams alive for those who stay focused and, and get a good team built around them. Uh, they can be those million dollar members as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.